English. Okay, więc so we change the language. We change the English. We change, uh, we change the language, and uh, now will be the first presentation. Uh, will be. Uh, Anita Kaiser, please. No, thank you. Ah, no, thank you. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present my uh, research results about surface modification of plates used for chest deformity treatment. Uh, the main aim of my presentation is to assess the usability of the nitrocarburized layer deposited on the plates used for the treatment of anterior chest wall deformity. Chest deformities include funeral and pigeon chest. These are congenital defects, and the pectus excavatum is when the ribs uh, and sternum grow inward and form a dent in the chest and it may cause problems tolerating exercise, tiredness, chest pain, a rapid heartbeat or heart palpitation or coughing, uh, while the pectus carinatum um, is a deformity of the chest wall in which the braced bone and ribs are pushed outward, and kids and teens with pectus carinatum may feel short of breath, especially during exercise, have a ha fast heartbeat, feel tired or have chest pain too. And uh, this condition gets worse as uh, kids grow and uh, occur more often in the boys than the girls. Mm, uh, one of the methods to use uh, to treat these um, defects is the minimally invasive uh, news procedure. In these methods, one, two, or more plates are inserted in the, into the uh, chest, uh, the inserted under or over the sternum to stabilize uh, the chest deformation. On the first uh, picture, you can see chest before surgery. It's a funeral chest. Um, the thoracic surgeon uh, on the first step uh, must uh, choose the length of the bar. Then the bar uh, is bending and inserted under the sternum and rotated 180 degrees using the instruments specially designed for this uh, purpose. The last step, uh, state is plate fixation, is essential to prevent displacement by applying pericostal sutures. Based on many scientific publications, it can be concluded that applying uh, for sta uh, on stainless steel for the plates may cause many undesirable effects after implantation. Uh, most often, uh, skin lesions or rashes uh, occur in the place when the plate is fixed to the ribs Mm, and it may uh, inflammation allergies, it may lead to inflammation allergies or even sepsis. The second problem was the plate rotation uh, during the daily patient's activities. Um, this uh, problem occurred because the plate was fixed to the ribs only with wires or surgical sutures. Mm, um, therefore, uh, with uh, my team, we modified the uh, structure of the uh, implants by adding additional crossbars and screws to prevent plate rotation after implantation. And this invention has been uh, patented. Um, unfortunately, the friction between plate and crossbars and crossbars and screws uh, may uh, occur um, the um, release of metal ions into the surrounding tissue and leads to uh, the uh, undesirable effects after implantation. Uh, so I proposed as for surface modifications and the research were performed, were carried out on two uh, group of implants, the first after electrochemical uh, polishing and the second with nitrocarburized layer. 
All uh, research were carried out on the samples after sterilization X and exposure to Ringer solution. Many structures, many studies has been uh, carried out. Uh, I will not um, uh, discuss uh, the details. I will summarize them uh, in conclusions, uh, but um, I carried out researches of mechanical, physical, chemical, and biological properties. Um, in the first, I carried out microstructure of the surface layer research. And you can see that for the nitrocarburized layer and for the substrate, so of the surface after uh, polishing, both uh, with a regular flat-centric structure was identified. The pitting corrosion resistance test uh, was carried out as a part of physical chemical properties, uh, the same uh, cleavage corrosion uh, resistance test. Mm, uh, next, I carried out a vitability and structure energy test, and you can see that the layer deposition resulted in an increase in the contact angel volume in relation to samples subjected to electrochemical polishing. Uh, you can see also that um, deposited of the layer on the surface resulted in a reduction in the mass of metal ions in the tested solution compared to polished samples. Next, the abrasion resistance tests were carried out as a part of mechanical properties, and the same uh, nano-hardness measurement, and you can see that diffusion layer deposited resulted in an increase in the surface hardness in relation to hardness of samples without the layer. I'm sorry. On the last stage, uh, I mm, carried out a biological properties test, in particular cytotoxicity, um, and on the based on uh, Obtain result, it can be conclusions that diffusion layer deposited on the electrochemically polished surface of stainless steel is characterized by a crystalline structure and limits the penetration of metal ions into the tissue environment. Its cytotoxicity effects has not been demonstrated. The most favorable electrochemical properties were obtained for the surface with the layer in its initial state and after stabilization. Exposure to Ringer solution reduced the resistance to pitting corrosions, although the obtained parameters indicate good corrosion resistance. Resistance to crevice corrosion for the substrate and layer is obtained after the sterilization process. A hydrophilic surface with low vitability is a beneficial phenomenon for short-term implants. Implant tests of mechanical properties showed a beneficial increase in hardness and abrasion resistance of the layer deposited in relation to the polished surface. And the biological tests conducted indicate high biocompatibility of the substrate material and the material with the modified surface. For all tested surfaces, cell survival was found to be above 70% which indicates the lack of the cytotoxic, uh, cytotoxic effects. If you have any questions, you can send me email. Uh, and now I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Next presentation. Uh, uh, next presentation, Aneta Jarna. Sorry. The doctor, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joanna Jaworska, and I work at the Center of Polymer and Carbon Materials of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, today I would like to tell you about my research on polymeric materials which are intended for medical application. Uh, materials that are not only poly polymeric but biodegradable, drug eluting, 
uh, and also mostly electrospun. Uh, there are two uh, main kinds of uh, biodegradable polymeric biomaterials, natural and synthetic. And I work in a field of synthetic uh, materials, uh, polyesters and polyesters carbonates. The characteristic features of these synthetic materials is that their properties can be tailored during synthesis uh, stage, also during uh, processing um, or other modification. Natural um, biomaterials are, um, there are some differences between uh, natural and synthetic um, materials. Uh, natural materials has rather weak uh, mechanical properties. Um, synthetic ones are, uh, can have um, very weak or also very good mechanical properties. It depends on the, um, on the po polymer. Uh, natural um, materials are also uh, hydro, uh, hydro, hydrophilic and thus it degrades uh, quite uh, fast and synthetic polymers can be uh, hydrophilic or hydrophobic. It also depends. Um, there are um, many, maybe not many, but there are some uh, biodegradable polymeric implants which are available already on the market, screws, pins, plates. And uh, if um, such implants um, has, have uh, drug uh, into the structure, such implant has, uh, is a delivery vehicle and has increased in functionality. And the uh, example of such uh, drug uh, loaded implant is a glider wafer, which is used in anti cancer therapy of brain cancer. And I'm work, I work uh, in the field of biodegradable drug eluting implants, which are um, also called drug delivery systems. Uh, These systems are very. Um, beneficial and um, they are used, um, they, are, they con uh, contain the degradable platform and the drug which is loaded in this platform. And such uh, system, such drug uh, loaded implant is uh, placed in a specific area of the body, uh, affected, cara uh, affected area and it's used uh, in that case for local regional administration of the drug for localized therapy. It means that such implants after um, placing uh, in the specific um, part of the body is um, starting degrading and uh, release the drug in the strict place. Uh, these systems are used for local regional enhanced uh, Excuse me. It's not just. It's um, um, it provides a lo local regional and enhanced dosage of the drug. Uh, at the same time, it um, um, it, it gives a reduced overall dosage of the drug, which is um, which is in the body. And in that uh, in that case, uh, there is also reduced uh, systemic toxicity uh, of the drug. And it's very uh, advantageous and beneficial, especially for anti-cancer therapy where um, very hazardous drugs are used. Um, polymeric, uh, synthetic polymeric uh, biomaterials can be processed by different methods. It can be processed by um, molding, uh, printing, by injection, and also what is lately uh, quite popular by electrospinning. Uh, electrospun materials are quite uh, extraordinary since uh, it, uh, they have um, high porosity, high, uh, very large surface, uh, specific surface area, uh, high volume to surface ratio, and that's um, high drug loading capacity, which is most uh, uh, interesting for me. Uh, during electrospinning, uh, the polymer uh, solution with additional substances like drugs uh, is uh, dosed by the nozzle 
uh, and in the presence of electric field, uh, it is, uh, the fibers are collected on the collector and then, uh, and then um, non-wovens are obtained. Uh, the non-woven structure is obtained, fiber structure. Uh, usually my, um, my research uh, contains um, such steps like uh, designing a um, new system, uh, characterizing of physical chemical properties with different methods, uh, char to characterize um, morphology of the fibers, and also drug release. Uh, I would like to now tell you some uh, details about my results. Um, uh, my results um, uh, from electrospan drug eluting materials, uh, which were um, enriched by uh, enriched with uh, drugs from taxan family. Uh, it, uh, it was paclitaxel, docetaxel, and cabazitaxel. The first drug is used uh, nowadays uh, in, brain, uh, in breast cancer therapy and uh, in ovarian therapy. Uh, and docetaxel and cabazitaxel is used in prostate cancer therapy. Uh, the starting point uh, for, my, for my research was uh, were drawbacks of chemotherapy. Uh, mostly uh, the high dose requirements for the standard chemotherapy and adverse side effects of the drugs which are used for standard chemotherapy. When you look on these drawbacks, it uh, seems that uh, many of them uh, are delivery related problems. And it would be very um, beneficial to deliver the drug uh, strictly to the uh, to the era of the um, of the illness of the cancer uh, in this situation, so I uh, focus on implants for targeted drug delivery. And the first group uh, about which I would like to tell you uh, are paclitaxel eluting patches as flex flexible non woven implants. I used, diff, uh, I used uh, polymers from the group of, group of polyesters. Uh, I, actually, I made a blend of uh, two polyesters with specific properties. I uh, enriched also uh, this, this mixture with the paclitaxel. And uh, during uh, optimization process, I obtained a good fiber forming mixture, since it's important for extra spinning. And then soft, soft flexible non-woven uh, materials were obtained. And first part of study was uh, in vitro study, which, were, which were, was conducted at the center of polymer carbon materials. Uh, the degradation study and drug release study was conducted. Uh, I've chosen uh, I've chosen the best material, and the best material for me was. Uh, material which uh, material which could uh, give a very uh, um, the best uh, the best drug release the best drug release is uh, for me is uh, release without any such an ejection of the drug or the burst release since it's not very good for uh, chemotherapy and this uh, this chosen material was. Uh, mm, was directed for in vivo study, uh, which uh, were, was conducted at the National Institute of Oncology in Gliwice. And uh, the scheme of this therapy is, uh, is uh, shown on the uh, picture. It was uh, studied on the um, murine model of breast cancer. Uh, first, uh, the um, breast cancer was um, um, developed under the skin at the back uh, side of the mice, since it's very good method for uh, examination, such materials. And then on the 11th day, uh, uh, skin was cut, it, skin was cut, and then uh, non-wovens were, were placed on the tumor. 
Uh, then the, the tumor growth was uh, monitored and analyzed. Uh, uh, in case of drug, in case of drug loaded, uh, in case of drug loaded uh, materials, which is this, the growth of the tumor was uh, slowed down in comparison with drug drug free nanoways. And it was in about 40% the, the, the tumor growth was reduced. Uh, this is the uh, proof that uh, non movements uh, degradate, really, really degradate. They deliver the drug, and the drug is still effective and active. And the second part of the in vivo study was. Uh, uh, was uh, this part, and uh, it was, um, we combined uh, local chemotherapy with the non ovens with the brachytherapy. It is uh, reported that paclitaxel um, uh, sensitized the tumor to the radiotherapy, thus we decided to choose this kind of therapy, combined therapy, and it appeared that uh, for combining therapy, the um, the result was, result was uh, better in about 4%. It means that the growth of the tumor was, uh, again, slowed down. Uh, and uh, uh, let me just uh, return to the slide. And this uh, topic is now continued in a, a project uh, of the National Science Center. Uh, and soon it will be, uh, some more results will be available. And now uh, I would like to tell you about other um, drug eluting uh, implants, uh, cabacetaxel eluting patches and docetaxel eluting patches. Uh, in, this kind, in this study I obtained different uh, materials. Uh, I used uh, uh, different polymers, uh, different polymers, however in this group uh, there was uh, the same material, polymeric material, and the different uh, drug. And mm, I uh, tried to compare how the drug uh, influence, uh, influences the properties and also drug release. Uh, in the second part, uh, I um, obtained different, totally different poly polymers and the same drug. Uh, mostly I was focused on uh, how uh, does it uh, influence on drug release. Um, and if you take a look on the um, release process of the drug, you can observe that uh, um, for different materials, for different drugs, it might be quite different uh, way of uh, releasing the drugs, which uh, can... Um, affect the uh, therapy. So for, uh, for, um, it, was a, um, it was a kind of fast degradation study. It was only 14 days, but I wanted to check if there was a burst release of the drug, which is not uh, good for, for my application. And I decided for further research, I decided to choose the best, uh, in my opinion, material, uh, which uh, which gave no burst effect of the drug, no sudden uh, eluting of the drug, and the degradation was quite uh, even. And I, um, I um, conducted a long-term study. I've checked if a fibrous structure uh, maintained uh, dru during the degradation study, and it, uh, it maintained. Uh, what can be seen here during 12 weeks, the fiber structure is still uh, observed, which is um, which is good uh, result, and the uh, uh, release of the drug was quite uh, satisfactory. And then uh, at the, in the Medical University of Silesia, we checked the anti-cancer activity of those materials on two prostate cancer line, and uh, for DU 145. Uh, this result, this result was uh, better, and uh, we can observe that in case of drug-loaded uh, patches, uh, we can uh, we can observe late apoptotic cells. 
and uh, I would like to switch now to the endourology. I also work on the maturas, uh, which, uh, which are drug eluting, and electrospan. Uh, the starting point for this research was um, uh, therapy of uh, ureteral uh, stones. And uh, during this therapy, ureteral stones are used. Uh, and there are only one biodrug label ureteral stand on the market at the moment. And now, and uh, none of, uh, of ureteral stones are drug eluting. So I thought that it might be uh, beneficial to obtain such material. And uh, the main uh, mm, this, this implantation of ureteral stents is very inconvenient for a patient, uh, especially at the beginning of the therapy, since the ureter has natural, natural mm, effect of uh, spasmo spasmodic effect, and this is inconvenient. So I obtained uh, drug-loaded material, papaverine-loaded material. Papaverine is an is antispasmodic drug, uh, and it could give uh, uh, this uh, spasm antispasmodic effect. And I also made an um, um, optimization uh, step to, uh, to obtain a good uh, fiber-forming uh, mixture. Uh, I obtained uh, flexible tubular scaffolds, uh, and uh, I checked how the, uh, how, um, how the fiber structure is changing during degradation. And the most important for me, uh, maybe not most important, however, it, very important for me, it was um, uh, a drug release. Uh, I wanted, uh, in this uh, situation, I wanted to obtain a burst effect contrary to anti-cancer materials. Now uh, this effect is uh, very um, very good since it uh, deliver a high it can deliver a high amounts of the drugs at the beginning of the implantation, uh, and this is the a very good example that uh, modification uh, since I use different materials uh, it's a good example that modification can regulate the drug release rate. And uh, that th this is what I try to use in my research. And the last part, uh, mm, these are uh, not electrospan materials, but uh, deep coated. I also uh, obtained drug eluting materials in a form of biodegradable bio coatings with a drug. And this is cooperation with Salesian University of Technology, the Faculty of Biomedical Engineering. We have uh, we had a, a national science center project, uh, and we developed uh, polymeric coatings on the metal substrate. And we've checked a lot of materials, a lot of polymeric materials, uh, uh, some drugs, antibacterial drugs, and at the Medical University of Silesia, we checked the anti. Uh, bacterial uh, effect of the coatings and mostly for cyprofloxacin such effect uh, was uh, very very uh, good um, and uh, it appeared that this very thin polymeric coating can also uh, mm, reduce the amount of uh, metal ions which are released from the metal uh, and uh, at the last slide, I would like to present mm, the team where I'm working. Uh, this is uh, the head of our team is Professor Kasperczyk. He uh, created quite a big uh, group. Uh, we are, uh, we are fo some, some people are focused on synthesis, uh, on processing with different methods, and some are degradation and drug delivery study. We are now uh, running a project of National Center for Research and Development on biodegradable filament for uh, 3D printing. We finished the uh, stand project. Uh, we also focused on uh, um, materials for wound healing, for scaffolds, and many, many others. Thank you.
Thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture, and uh, now I invite you the next speaker, Maciej Gawlikowski. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, um, last 10, maybe last 15 years, it was an amazing uh, equipment if the, in the clinics in, uh, in the field of the mechanical heart, heart supporting. And now, nowadays, it's realized by means of the, uh, by means of the implantable rotary blood pumps or in some cases by means of the pulsating extracorporeal blood pumps. Uh, let's see the Intermax report, which uh, tells us that uh, for the last 10 years, more than 27,000 patients were treated by, uh, by a mechanical heart supporting, by the mechanical heart supporting therapy. Each year, about 3,000 patients. We have 3,000 patients in the whole world. However, when we analyze the, uh, the hazard function of the Kaplan-Meier uh, survival analysis, uh, we can observe that um, the highest risk of death of our patients is uh, uh, before the sixth month of the supporting. So let's focus on this, on this problem and let's discuss why. Uh, next chart from the, uh, from the Intermax report tells us the, one of the most uh, important um, adverse event is a stroke. Uh, in the first year of uh, supporting 13 of uh, supported patients uh, will suffer from the stroke. This is a serious adverse event because it makes people handicapped. It makes the quality of life of this patient are very, very poor and in most cases is leading to patient death. Uh, what's, the, um, what's the reason that the blood is, is, is uh, clotting? Uh, this is the, one of the first uh, clinically used uh, rotary blood pump. This is an actual construction, heart made too. Um, the rotational speed of this pump was rather high because it's uh, 12,000 uh, 12, RPMs and the numerical analysis uh, revealed that the highest shear stress uh, is occurring in the marked region. High shear stress means the blood uh, platelet activation and to growing the fibric clots inside um, uh, the external parts of impeller and some uh, outflow and inflow part of the, of the pump. Uh, the solution of this uh, problem may be uh, knowledge what is a resistance of the platelet to the shear stress. It's not too easy to make an investigation on, on living platelets. So uh, there were many uh, ex, uh, in, vitro, in vitro experiments which revealed that the, uh, uh, the, the critical uh, shear stress which activates the platelets depends, of course, on the exposure time. However, the critical uh, it's assumed that it was 10 pascals. It's very, very low. In the uh, fluid dynamics, it's very, very low uh, uh, level is 10, 10 pascals. And look that the, uh, the, the red blood cells are uh, more resistant uh, to, the, uh, to the shears because the, uh, the critical value is uh, about 100 pascal. So the engineers constructed next generation of the blood pump and uh, it was bearingless uh, impeller levitation. Uh, there were two forces. First uh, originated from the permanent magnets, and the second was produced uh, by the moving impeller. And the balance of uh, those forces made that impeller was levitating inside the pump housing. There were a small gap between the uh, impeller surface and the blood uh, and the pump housing, about 10 micrometers, in some cases uh, 50 micrometers. So the engineers expected that the more is the gap, below is shear stress, and the clotting uh, inside the blood pump will be lower. It 
a period that, it's, that it wasn't uh, true because in uh, clinics we were observed a lot of clots formation inside uh, the pump housing and in the channels of the of the impeller. Let's discuss this phenomena. Uh, blood is a liquid uh, connective tissue and like each liquid and it's um, subjected to the fluid mechanics, fluid mechanics law. One of the crucial parameters in the fluid mechanics is viscosity and blood is a suspension uh, of the morphotic components uh, in the plasma. So the viscosity of blood depends on the shear rate, it's non, it's non uh, Newtonian liquid, uh, on the hematocrit and on the, um, uh, on the concentration of the fibrinogen. This is a, a coagulation protein. But uh, not so many people know about the Farol-Linquist effect. This is an effect, this is a hemodynamic uh, uh, effect uh, concerned the suspensions. Blood is a suspension. Uh, and uh, look that the smaller is tube diameter, the lower is suspension viscosity. But here we have a critical point. Before this, the uh, blood viscosity significantly increased. So in my, in my opinion, the gap between the impeller and the pump housing uh, is changing, for example, due to the uh, heart beating. And we are before the critical point, so viscosity of blood suddenly, in, uh, suddenly increased. Uh, in this case, uh, the result of this case is uh, increasing viscosity, increasing shear stress, and it's leading to the clot forming inside the pump. Next step in the development of the, uh, of the rotary blood pump was uh, um, constructing of uh, the pump with the uh, large gap, it's about 1,000 micrometers. It could be done uh, uh, due to the development of the active active levitation, active levitation of, of impeller. It's interesting because uh, the impeller size is, uh, is relatively small uh, comparing with the levitation, levitation system, but it didn't solve the clotting problem in the blood pump. Of course, we, have, uh, we haven't observed the, the clots inside the pump, but the clots moved from the interior of the pump to the inflow cannula and to the outflow, outflow graft. So we have still a challenge how to, pumping, how to pump the blood without activation of platelets. Um, next problem, coming back to the Intermax report, next problem is the bleeding, especially gastrointestinal. Intestinal bleeding looked that after uh, one year more then 20% uh, of patients with, uh, will suffer uh, from the gastrointestinal bleeding. And the, um, in this case, uh, hematologists and other uh, uh, biologists dis di uh, discovered that the reason of, um, of this is the f uh, segmentation and degradation of uh, von Willebrand factor. The Fulvillebrand factor is a large protein which plays a significant role uh, during the uh, blood clotting. And uh, Fulvillebrand factor makes, makes that it's possible to adhere the activated platelets to the uh, fibrin, uh, to, um, to the uh, damaged uh, endothelial, uh, uh, endothelial cells. Um, Next investigations, ne next investigation revealed that rotary blood pumps uh, make a degradation of high molecular weight mul uh, uh, multimers of the von Willebrand factor. Look at this statistic. After uh, 90 days of supporting, we can observe significant degradation of von, von Willebrand factor, and it's leading to the gastrointestinal bleeding. Uh, what is the resistance of the of uh, von Willebrand factor to the shear? Unfortunately, it's not so high. It's about 10 pascals. So it means that the physiological blood pumping must or have to assure the shear st stress less than 10 pascals. And this is the first challenge 
uh, to the future. Next, coming back to the uh, Intermax uh, report, uh, it was a surprise for me. In 2000th century, when you have sophisticated antibiotics, in the first six weeks of, uh, after the uh, blood pump supporting, 20% of patients will suffer from the infection. Infection. Why? Because the implantation is a huge surgery. Mm, uh, in most cases, it's done uh, due to the sternotomy. The sternum is uh, uh, opened, and this is a heart with implanted rotary blood pumps. This is an uh, HVAT pump. And the consequence of infection looks like this. This is one of a patient, uh, 16 years old, teenager, and after the aggressive uh, ant uh, antibiotic therapy, he is not hearing now. He lost her hearing due to the infection after the blood pump implantation. Um, it's possible to make implantation of, uh, of heart supporting system via the vascular access. And look, this is the impeller blood pump. Very small impeller, very small impeller, 2.5 liter per minute, but in the in case of the cardiogenic shock, it's enough for the patient. But look, this 33,000 um, uh, of RPM. Could you imagine what high is a shear stress near the, the leaflets of the impeller? However, the implantation of the pump is very easy. Um, in most cases, it's done uh, through the femoral artery. However, uh, in, in this slide, I demonstrated uh, the implantation uh, via the axillary, uh, axillary artery through the small port. It's easy. It's safe for the patient. The risk on, of infection is very, very low. So the next challenge is a non-invasive uh, blood pump implantation from the vascular axis, not from the sternotomy, not for the lateral thoracotomy, but from the vascular axis. Um, you are wondering what uh, Arnold is doing here, but he was an inspiration for me uh, because Terminator uh, was a connection between living tissue and machine. Could you imagine that our colleagues from uh, from the Karmat company from France, did it. They connected the artificial materials with the decellularized pericardium tissue. And they uh, developed the artificial heart with the biological surface in, uh, inside, here in the membrane and here in the valves. Um, they have uh, a lot of implantation uh, now and what's uh, the most important for me? Um, after the plantation of this artificial heart, after uh, one and a half year of treating the patient, our colleagues from France, from Karmat, observed the endothelial cells located inside the pericardium. So it means that some biological process, we don't know uh, by which way it's it's, is, it, is it possible? Uh, but some biological process make that, uh, don't, that uh, patient endothelial cells is growing in the pericardium. So it's a simple way to make a total uh, biocompatible biomaterials. It's amazing that I hope that, uh, that I will see it in the future. Um, Challenge number three, it was a challenge uh, number three, uh, is uh, to use the biological uh, active coatings. Last but not least, uh, you should be conscious that uh, after implantation of rotary blood pump, the patient is discharged home after six, seven weeks. So we couldn't observe it and we couldn't um, detect the malfunction of the pump, the uh, thromboem thromboembolization, uh, complication, etc., etc. So it's important to introduce the 
uh, telemonitoring of the patient. This is the first uh, first issue. And next uh, is to introduce the non-invasive methods of assessment of the complication in the blood pumps. This is uh, one of uh, my work, uh, which with my team from Foundation for Cardiac Se uh, for uh, Cardiac Surgery uh, Development. Uh, we discovered the algorithm uh, to, uh, which is able to detect the thromboembolism of the rotary blood pump by means of analysis of the power consumption and the uh, spectral analysis of vibroacoustic signal generated by the pump. Uh, next problem is a, a suction event in the left ventricle. It uh, occurs when the patient is, de is dehydrated. It uh, occurs only, uh, maybe not only, but most often in the night. Um, so the separated uh, suction event is not a problem. However, the uh, continuous is a problem because uh, it leads to the, uh, to the platelet activ uh, activation and even to the, hemo the uh, hemolysis. So why uh, not to introduce the uh, automated algorithm of driving the blood pumps? Why not? Maybe not. Why? because our colleagues from Karmat discovered this kind of algorithm, and look, it reacts to the exercise of the patients. During more than one year, the algorithm maintained the cardiac index, but when the patient was starting the exercise, the flow generated by the pump increased. So we have feedback between, uh, between the organimes as the hemodyna hemodynamic condition in the organimes and the driving of the blood pump. Uh, so this is the next uh, challenge to, to develop the automation algorithm and the telemonitoring. Um, one time Professor Zembala uh, on the um, uh, short meeting in the Salesian Center of Heart Disease when we were presented the a remote uh, monitoring system uh, for the patient uh, with uh, left ventricular assist devices told us that the place of a doctor is with the patient, not at the computer. And concluding my speech, I agree with Professor Zambala. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. And uh, now the next speaker is. Pandalusz Dobrowolski. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for your kind invitation uh, for this wonderful conference. And now uh, we move to the ophthalmology, to the cornea. And I'll be talking about uh, different scaffolds in the different applications. Uh, and now I start with the uh, description of the disease we try to treat. And uh, on the corner surface, uh, we have in fact two environments, micro environments, which include a corneal epithelium. Corneal epithelium is over there, over the cornea and the conjunctival epithelium. Conjunctival epithelium and the conjunctiva at all is a, a tissue which is vascularized and is not transparent. And to see, we need the transparent epithelium on the cornea and the transparent cornea, transparent stroma, transparent lens, and of course, healthy retina. But there are some diseases which cause uh, loss of uh, transparency of the cornea, like injuries, sometimes after surgery of the surface, uh, and, and in contact lens wearers, sometimes cornea uh, became non-transparent. And uh, non-transparent conjunctiva growths over the, the corneal epithelium, over the corneal surface. Uh, as you see on this photo, this is uh, really problematic for the patient because if we see with the center part of the cornea and something which is vascularized and non-transparent with uh, such haze uh, on the tissue, 
such patients loses uh, his vision. So we need to restore. We need to restore proper anatomy of the of the coronal surface. This condition uh, sometimes uh, after injuries, for example, chemical burns. Sometimes it's very severe conditions. It's called limbal stem cells deficiency because. Uh, Corneal uh, epithelium uh, has its source in the limbus, in the peripheral cornea. Periphery cornea. There are stem cells uh, which produce epithelium, which is transparent, which, which is regular, which causes uh, the cornea smooth and transparent. So uh, if we lose those features, so we have uh, this, this integration of the epithelial integrity, loss of coronary nerves, activation of uh, stroma scarring, and persistent inflammation. This eye is, is uh, all the time inflamed. It's red, it's, uh, sometimes it causes uh, pain for all the time for the patient, even at night. So it's a very non-comfortable condition for the patient. As I said, uh, you see here the, the all uh, features of the limbal stem cell deficiency. Ingrowth of the conjunctiva, scarring, loss of vision, loss of coronal transparency. It's very important to restore uh, the healthy epithelium, also to restore to have a good epithelial basement membrane. Because the epithelial basement membrane, in fact, is holding uh, epithelial cells. Without the, the, uh, the healthy epithelial basement membrane, uh, we lose the epithelium, we lose the transparency, and finally, it causes the, gener uh, gener uh, the degeneration of the underneath lying stroma. So it's also another, another point to lose uh, coronal transparency. In confocal microscopy, uh, we can find uh, first stages of the conjunctal invasion. These gray cells come from conjunctiva, and first are cells, then vessels are grow, growing into the cornea. That's why uh, the cornea looks very bad. It's not transparent, not uh, uh, covered with regular epithelia, and also it's vascularized. How we can restore the cornea, the corneal epithelium, in fact? We can uh, use our own epithelium, of course, if uh, the second eye is healthy. If not, we need a donor. So it can be related living donor, a mother, father, or completely allogenic donor. So if we have a healthy eye, we can take the biopsy of the limbus, of the source of the stem cells for the epithelium. There, there's the conjunctiva, you see the vessels, it's not transparent, and epithelium, which is transparent, the cornea is over there uh, transparent. So if we took uh, the piece of um, uh, limbal area, peripheral area, we can find their stem cells for the epithelium, and this is the way to, to treat such the disease. Of course, in uh, mild uh, diseases, when the dysfunction of uh, limbal area is only local, we can uh, take the piece of epithelium from other part of the eye, or the second eye, and move to the infected area. But coming to the uh, treatment, we have uh, conventional, I say, treatment, uh, including uh, transplantation or translocation, in fact, pieces of the limbal area, it's claw or sled, and also uh, classical grafts from the donors, uh, which is conjunctival limbal allograft or keratolimbal allograft. I show in the next slide uh, what it looks like. And uh, the newest method, are the method uh, which we use cultivated limbal stem cells transplantation. In fact, the number of limbal stem cells uh, in a graft is really limited because if we have a cultivated epithelium, the number 
of uh, limbal stem cells uh, inside the structure of the epithelium, it's no more than 5% only, but it's enough to, re to, to induce renewal of the epithelium. Another interesting source is a cultivated oral mucosa, mucosa epithelium. It's a piece of oral mucosa from our mouth because if we uh, culture the epithelium coming from from mouth from the uh, uh, mucosal part, uh, we can uh, receive um, epithelial layer with phenotypically almost similar to the corneal epithelium. Uh, there are only uh, some cases when we use it. Usually, if the if the damage uh, is in both eyes and we have a good allogenic donor. So it's a, also an autologic way of treatment. So it's very interesting and it's also very difficult. However, it's possible. So it's a classic way. Classic way, this is a part of the donor cornea, peripheral. We can transplant it. However, such uh, patient uh, needs immunosuppression for the whole life. So it's a uh, very, very intensive treatment for years. Another thing is uh, application of, uh, of the limbus with the conjunctiva. It's a little bit less invasive. However, also we need a donor. However, we also need a donor. And uh, our idea um, started uh, from the amniotic membranes because amniotic membrane is uh, commonly used uh, as a protective method uh, for the ocular ciphers after burns, uh, after um, surgical procedures uh, we use amniotic membrane to cover uh, damages of the uh, ocular surface. However, uh, amniotic membrane has its own base membrane and the epithelium of the amnion. If we remove the cells, we could put the coronal epithelium on the base membrane and the amniotic membrane uh, can be used as a carrier, as a scaffold, for carry healthy cells. And this project we started in uh, 2009 uh, and we perform oh, over the, uh, 40 surgeries with this method and uh, with quite good results because finally 70% uh, uh, of, of uh, treated patients uh, uh, had restored vision with this method. But this is, I said, classical way and we need another tissue. Not only a tissue from the donor, from the patient, from this healthy eye, but also the amniotic membrane. So we have, in fact, two different tissues. Uh, and another, another idea was to carry only cells, but we need the, the scaffold, the carrier. Uh, it's a fibrin gel, which is accepted by European Medicine Agency. Uh, it's called... Uh, uh, Holoclar, and we also uh, take the, the uh, biopsy, the biopsy is sent to the laboratory where our epithelial cell expanded on the, on the fibrin gel and uh, the, the fibrin finally is delivered to the hospital and they apply it in the, in the patient. Of course, first we remove all tissues and put the uh, put the fibrin gen on the, on the cornea. However, is the problem how to fix it? Because the previous one, amniotic membrane, we can put the sutures and no problem. Put the sutures and the amniotic membrane is fixed perfectly on the eye. But uh, how do it with the, with the gel? If we just put it, <laughs> patient blinks and, and the gel is out. So, <laughs> the idea is, uh, is to uh, do the larger, larger uh, plates of the, of the fibrin. Uh, the cornea usually has 12 millimeters. So the fibrin uh, has six, 16. And we cut the conjunctiva 
We cut the conjunctiva around the cornea and we create the pocket, pocket here. And the peripheral, uh, peripheral uh, fibrin, part of fibrin gel is under, under the conjunctiva. We put the sutures on, only on the conjunctiva and the conjunctiva is holding the, the gel on the surface. Sometimes we, we, to protect the, the gel, which is covered by the epithelium, we use sometimes uh, contact lenses. So it's a good, good way to protect the, the graft uh, containing uh, epithelium and stem cells. We also try to find something which is um, more, uh, uh, which has better mechanical properties. We try to do a chitosan membrane, uh, which is really strong, but the problem is uh, with the biodegradation of the, of the chitosan. Uh, if we look at the amniotic membrane, degradation of amniotic membrane um, lasts weeks, sometimes two, sometimes eight. Uh, fibrin uh, degradates within up to three days, so really quickly. So if you have uh, the layer of cells, the layer of cells quickly goes to the, to the uh, stroma, to the surface of the stroma. But with the, with the chitosan, it was the problem because in laboratory we observed uh, moths for, for <laughs> degradation in uh, culture media. So we uh, modified uh, uh, chitosan membranes with collagen, elastin, uh, hydroxypropyl cellulose. So uh, finally, finally uh, we received degradation with, within one mouth. Another problem was the surface, uh, how to put the cells on it. So uh, many most of experiments, uh, different concentration of chitosan, different concentration of collagen, and we finally, finally find the, the uh, uh, structure of the chitosan, which uh, were able to carry cells. Uh, however, uh, it, uh, we still work on this because, because we have an agreement for apply uh, this kind of uh, scaffold for, for the patient. And what we are doing in, uh, uh, in Zabrze right now? Right now we try to uh, mm, prepare original Polish method of, of the uh, treatment. Uh, we started uh, last year, in fact, on the, on the PIC model. And uh, for the last uh, few months, uh, laboratory in Cardiomet uh, tried to put, take from the PIC the limbal area and to uh, receive the uh, epithelium of the, cor of the cornea, of the PIC cornea. And in fact, uh, we are succeeded, and we, we now came to the experiments of the of the animals. And this is the first step, in fact, to receive the uh, culture of the regular epithelium, stratified epithelium, because it has to be stratified to cover regularly the cornea. So it's uh, really challenging to to receive the uh, material, which will be applicable in animals. Okay, next one. So we, of course, have to identify the cells. Uh, CK14 is a cytokeratin. It's a characteristic uh, cytokeratin for the cornea. There are also cytokeratin, free cytokeratin uh, 12, and also protein uh, P63, which is responsible for proliferation of cells. If, the, if, if we find such protein, in the population of cells in the culture, we are sure that uh, those cells uh, transmitted to the eye, transmitted to the ocular ciphers, will produce epithelial cells for mouth. In fact, um, the oldest uh, our experience with uh, transplanted epithelium in humans 
it's not over than 20 years. And we see that cells transplanted, and the first experiments uh, were, in, 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 were published in 2000, but many of these patients uh, from Italy still see and stand, still have uh, reconstructed surface and transplanted epithelium. So uh, we can suppose that the transmitted cells, transmitted stem cells of the epithelium still, still work. So uh, if we have P63, we are sure uh, that the, the, the renewal of the epithelium will be continuous. So we try to uh, receive uh, the fibrin gel, which is as thin as possible. I saw the scaffolds from, from the Italy, which are you know, really thick. Now, uh, our scaffolds, uh, which are uh, prepared in Zabrze, I think it's one third of, of uh, scaffolds which I applied a few years ago, which I received from, from Italy, from the laboratory of Professor Pellegrini. So uh, I think, I think uh, we are close to the, to the really uh, good material, which is uh, uh, really thin and easy to applicate in a hospital uh, where in an operation a room. And of course, uh, it should be uh, strength enough to, to put on the cornea. Maybe we receive uh, material which will be able to uh, hold the sutures on it. So this will be a very, very nice advantage of, the, of, the, of our research. And the next step, um, next step is a sub. <laughs> of course, uh, advantages of, of our efforts, and I skip more. Uh, if we put uh, the epithelial cells uh, in the suspension, uh, they form colonies. They form colonies and then form the epithelium. It um, takes, uh, in fact, two weeks. To, to receive regular mm, multi-layer of the epithelium, which, which has a regular surface. So we go to the bioprinting to put regular cells on the fibrin. And because it probably uh, allows us to receive the regular layer of the epithelium within, I hope, one week or less. Uh, because the, why we try to shorten this time. Because uh, if we have uh, cells uh, in natural conditions of the eye, in the natural tear film, uh, the degradation, uh, the possible uh, mutations in the cells are less possible. So as quickly we take the cells to the patient from the laboratory, that's the advantage for the patient. So that's why we're looking still for, uh, for the method which, uh, uh, which give us the, short, uh, sh the shortest way to take the cells, to culture them and transmit to the patient. Imagine that the uh, uh, method which I saw Holocar from, from Italy, uh, we need uh, a few a few more, in fact, to receive the, the material which is applicable to the patient. So, so we try to skip this problem, the time of preparation to the, to the, uh, the material to the transplantation. And of course, uh, this model, uh, it's, it's, things, uh, it's a way to, to uh, come back uh, to the patient treatment in the future, in a uh, Polish original uh, method, uh, I would say that, that uh, uh, Italian method is, is really expensive. It's, it's about 90,000 euros for, for one patient. So, so, so it's really, really expensive. Uh, I hope that we... Uh, we offer in the future the, the Polish method to the Polish patient. So, in conclusion, so in fact, um, 
the, the scaffolds we, we use of fibrin or, or other other materials, we try to have a sort of uh, basement membrane for the epithelium. In fact, uh, human epithelium uh, can restore its own ep basement membrane, but it lasts a year. It's it's a very very slow process. So that's why we need something which is uh, applicable, which is biodegradable, and helps us for for this uh, natural regeneration to wait this year, this month. Uh, of course. Uh, Second, second thing is to have a carrier for the epithelial cells, which is uh, also biodegradable, uh, but which is also stable and um, holds the cells because there are no no uh, proteins in the in the uh, fibrin which are holding holding the cells, so, so we we can't do it. Right now, can we do it? Maybe, maybe with bioprinting, it will be possible in the future. Uh, however, we we need a good carrier for the cell prop, uh, propagation, and of course, uh, I uh, showed you before that's really inflammatory, pro-inflammatory disease. So we need uh, a material with low inflammation capacity, no inducing inflammation. So uh, new materials like fibrin, like uh, amniotic membrane, like, like scaffolds based for hitazon, for example, are the uh, hope for patients for, for good uh, applying uh, cultivated cells in, in the medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for very interesting uh, lecture and uh, now I, I want to open uh, the next uh, part of our session, the discussion. Uh, I propose that uh, we start with the opposite direction that was uh, presented and uh, we start with uh, the Professor Dobrowski. Uh, and do you have any question? If you prefer maybe Polish language. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, now we have a uh, very uh, a lot of uh, materials which is uh, used. Uh, we researched the uh, uh, optical properties of uh, these materials, which is used, and uh, what is the influence of this uh, cell, and uh, the, uh, another <coughs> what is the influence of the cell, and the time of the these uh, properties, and uh, when uh, is upper this uh, operation, this uh, patient uh, see the same all time, and uh, this is the change with the time, and uh, you said that uh, this same time take uh, two years, yeah? Yes, in fact, uh, many depends on the condition of the patient at the beginning of the treatment. Uh, in fact, many of them are, um, have very damaged and the cornea, with opacification, uh, loss of stroma. So we have two options, to uh, restore only the epithelium, if the stroma is quite good or transparent, or to do the uh, reconstruction of the epithelium and then uh, keratoplasty, so transplantation of the cornea. So, so there are two ways to approach us to, to receive the transparency of the cornea. You asked also about uh, transparency of uh, scaffolds. Um, uh, Kytosan-based uh, uh, scaffolds are transparent. However, however uh, the problem is, as I said, uh, timing of biodegradation. And it's still uh, working on this. And, and uh, uh, additional uh, um, proteins like collagen, like elastin, uh, should, have, uh, should help us to, to resolve this problem. If we uh, talk about amniotic membrane, amniotic membrane usually is disappearing uh, in a few weeks. Uh, and usually, uh, regeneration of the superficial coronary stroma uh, caused the uh, restoration of the transparency 
within a few months. So it's uh, quite satisfactory for the patient. Right now, the best material for carrying cells uh, is fibrin, which disappears within five, five days. And, uh, and the cells are growing on the, on the stroma and they are, they are restoring the, the uh, basement membrane. However, we should protect them, protect them be because after surgery there is no basement membrane at all. So, so we use contact lenses, sometimes uh, the closure of the, of the eye for, for the long time. However, results are very good because um, from this group uh, which I uh, operated with, with the uh, amniotic membrane, uh, there was a few patients with 100% uh, of vision and uh, better results uh, even was uh, in the fibrin group uh, where uh, success rate was over 60% and over then 25% uh, of patients receive 100 patients of vision. So, so it's really, really good results. Of course, we are a little, uh, we are a little bit worse than the Italian group. Uh, they have success rate uh, over 70% 70, 70 so, so really good. Uh, but as usual, uh, in medicine, is, uh, it, uh, many, many uh, depends uh, on the qualification. If the disease uh, is limited only to the epithelium, the results are very good. If there are any uh, deeper damages, of course, this result is, is worse. However, it's uh, the, the huge comfort for the patient to restore, to stop inflammation, to such patient with the limbal stem deficiency. In fact, it's difficult to open the eyes. But, but patient after surgery, they maybe they, they have uh, decreased vision, uh, but they, they comfort for, for every day is uh, very good. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker was uh, <coughs> Professor Gavlikowski. Uh, do you have any questions for this lecture? How you think? Uh, what is the future of uh, <laughs> this plant? Uh, because uh, maybe two decades, maybe one decade uh, was we all have a very help. Uh, we, uh, was a dream about this that the uh, tissue engineering uh, help us in this case. Yeah, maybe the <laughs> hard is very complicated, that, uh, but uh, how you think? What is the future of this? <coughs> Um, I think that future are not uh, artificial blood pumps. I think that future is the uh, biological organs, maybe printed in 3D technology, maybe grow uh, from the um, from the steam cells, but uh, um, solution which I presented in in my speech, it was machines. Even if we maybe uh, we will be uh, make a uh, recellularization of the uh, previously decellularized tissue um, now the blood pumps is only a mechanism in my opinion the future is in the biological tissue and the future is in the uh, and uh, the tissue and uh, tissue engineering however we have to pay attention that we must have time to grow this organ. And in this time, the mechanical heart supporting will be present in the, in the clinics, in future, of course. Now, we have only two ways, except, of course, the pharmacological therapy. First way is a heart transplantation. A lack of donors, it's uh, obviously you know about it. Uh, so we can do only what can we do only is uh, uh, implant the uh, machine. In Poland, um, 
the longest uh, surviving time on the uh, rotary blood pump is uh, now is a six and a half year. Six and, six and a half uh, years. Um, in the whole world, I heard about 10 years sur uh, surviving, but I have never uh, uh, saw this kind of, of cases. So um, the answer is tissue engineering and biological organ, maybe genetic engineering. This is the uh, future machine that um, left it in the Terminator movie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, next speaker uh, was the <laughs> Professor Jaworsk and uh, Professor Kaiser. I have the one question. Maybe earlier, do you have any questions? Thank you. I have one question now about the future. Uh, it was a very impressive uh, research, very impressive outcomes and very promising and hopeful. I think we all agree with that. Um, but what are your plans regarding your um, study area? Do you plan to conduct, for, to concentrate further on those different fields, on those different tumors? Uh, do you plan to uh, continue your preclinical and go to clinical trials or you want for example to start to work on different type of tumor blank I guess okay yes uh, I've got uh, big plans uh, now I have sent my project proposal for National Science Center to um, to conduct more advanced study on uh, materials for prostate cancer treatment. I've uh, presented you cabazitaxel and docetaxel loaded patches, and now I would like to, if I get a <laughs> finance for that, I would like to continue it on animal model um, and to make more advanced uh, system. Um, this, uh, I, I'm, I'm planning to make a um, system with uh, different uh, uh, layers of the polymer and each polymer will be um, loaded with, uh, two with different drugs uh, since uh, it is known that um, um, after, after some time of prostate uh, cancer therapy, the patients are um, resistant to docetaxel and then my idea is to, um, to provide a drug release in a specific time. Uh, after some time, uh, after docetaxel, I would like to deliver cabazitaxel since uh, in novel chemotherapy, it's the way of treating uh, the prostate cancer when it's get uh, uh, resistant to docetaxel. These are my plans. However, it is a project proposal which was sent, and I'm waiting for the result. We'll see. We'll keep looking yeah. for Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Thank you very much. And first question, uh, first speaker was the Professor Kaiser. Do you have any questions? Maybe I try to uh, connect uh, two presentations, the first and the second. Uh, how do you think uh, it's possible to apply the biodegradable uh, polymers uh, for these implants? I think it's not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you for <coughs> yeah, your present on this uh, session. And uh, thank you for our speakers. Uh, one again. And I invite you uh, to the